turkey kind of mm -mm, bacon and it's whipping up here. Man, I want to preach fast today. Yeah. All right. First Thessalonians uh, chapter five. All right. Amen. It's good to be saved. It's good to be in church. You say, Pastor Hank, why do you say that every week? Because it is good to be saved. It's the best thing. It's the greatest thing God has done is that he has saved your soul. And it's good to be in church. And that would that is where God would want us to be each and every Sunday. So amen. It's good to be saved. It's good to be in church. First Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to start at verse 14. Uh, the Apostle Paul writing to the New Testament church, which is us. And he's writing here to the Thessalonians here. He says in verse 14, now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow which is good, uh, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophecies, prophecies. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearances of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that called you, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with an holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. That's a nice little kind of conclusion there for the book. And let's pray. Father, again, it is good to be saved and it's good to be in church. Lord, and Lord we ask you to bless the message now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, my focus is going to be on verse 18, uh, which says, In everything... Give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. All right, and uh, this is Thanksgiving week. And on Thanksgiving Day, us Christians and uh, give thanks to God for all the things uh, he's done for us. Now, Brother Don, this year I'm not going to give the turkey quiz. All right? We did that last year. I'm going to say it to the, I know you guys are, I hope past that give the turkey quiz because I know the answer. No, I'm going to skip it till next year. I got a, I got a new message here. But we'll, we'll, we'll do the turkeys next year. Now, before we get to verse 18, uh, let's look at a few verses here in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5. Uh, Paul here is at the end of, of his first epistle here in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and he's exhorting uh, the Thessalonians. Look at verse 14. He says, now we exhort you brethren. Now, to exhort means to encourage, to embolden, to cheer, to advise, to warn, to caution, to incite by words or advice, to animate or urge by arguments to a good deed or to any laudable conduct uh, uh, or course of action. Uh, um, I had, like I said before, I had a nice conversation with one of our uh, friends here in the church and they gave me some good advice and I felt like they were exhorting me. They were encouraging me. They were trying to cheer me. They're trying to advise me. They were giving me some ideas. Uh, to do with some of the ministries and food and stuff, and, and I took them to heart. And, uh, you know, it's a pastor's job to exhort, but it's also good that we can exhort each other. We should encourage each other, all right? It's good to be saved. It's good to be in church. It's good to be in God's house. It's good to be with fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord. And we want to come to church, and we want to exhort each other. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to be doom and gloom, all right? I know, I know gas is, you know, expensive, home heating fuel is expensive, and the IRAs have gone down, and uh, the country's a mess, politicians, I don't trust any of them, uh, but in God's house and, and, and in the presence of brothers and sisters, it is our job to exhort each other, all right? And also in verse 14, we see, uh, uh, we're continuing here, in verse 14, we see, uh, warn them that are unruly. That's the duty of the pastor, as well as... Uh, uh, the deacons and even individual church members to warn and admonish those uh, who are not living uh, that who are not living to what the Bible uh, states instead are living contrary to what the Bible says all right um, warn them that are unruly sometimes we we have unruly people that come to church they may be new they, they may do silly things well 
couple years ago, we had a lady get up in the back and she started asking me questions during the service and it was like she was unruly. <laughs> and I just said, ma'am, uh, don't interrupt the preacher while he's preaching. Uh, we'll discuss that later. And I, I, don't, I don't think she took her medicine that day and, and she was, you know, she was a little unruly. All right? We also continue verse 14. We need to comfort the feeble-minded. Right? We we're here to help and comfort those uh, that may be a, a little slower than us. All right, that could be someone that is uh, physically or, or mentally dependent upon a uh, society. And uh, the church uh, is a hospital. It's a place for hurting people. And, and there are those that are weak-minded or feeble-minded, and it's the church's job to help. I also, he says in verse 14, support the weak. Right? It's, as Christians, it's our duty to support uh, weak people, uh, people who are physically weak. Uh, we have some old timers here in the church, and I say this with love, but you know, they're, they're a little slow, they're weak, and sometimes we need to help them up and down the stairs, we need to help them uh, to their cars, we need to maybe pick them up or bring them here. Um, listen, my, I talked to my dad yesterday, he's 82, and he, 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 he could barely walk, and I said, Dad, you gotta go to the doctor, you gotta take your medicine. I said, I got old timers that are 85 and 90, they're still hopping and bopping and driving and coming, I said, Dad, come on, man, get off the couch, and Get, get a little exercise going, all right? But we're going to support those that are weaker than us, all right? Uh, Paul writes in Romans 15, 1, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. We also need to support those uh, in the church who are not just only physically weak, uh, but maybe are spiritually weak. Uh, they may be weak in their commitment. They may be weak in their church attendance. They may be weak in their tithing. Uh, they may be weak in, in many different things, and it's our job as a Christian to exhort and to encourage people and to support those that need help. Um, you know, my pastor Hank policy is that um, if someone misses church one week, okay, you know, maybe they're sick or maybe they're on vacation, but if they miss two weeks, then that Monday you're going to get the 9.15 in the morning phone call, you know, I, I mean, listen, I'm up at 6, but I, uh, usually it's, I, honestly, it's 10.15. If I call someone at 9.15, they're going to still be sleeping. I mean, but they get to 10.15, how you doing? Is everything okay? You know, not inflicting past or guilt, but everybody interprets it that way. But I just want to know, how you doing? You okay? Is everything all right? You know, sometimes, sometimes it's the pastor is the last guy that finds out what's going on. You know, I didn't know you were on vacation. Not, nobody told me. Hey, I didn't know you were you were sick and in the hospital. Nobody told me. I'm one of the few pastors that gives out his cell number, his email address. You guys know where I live. I mean, you can call me any, and I was just, and, and some people do, but some people are like, ah, the pastor will find out somehow. Uh, what do you think? I'm a prophet. I can just you know kind of say, God, tell me what's going on. <laughs> it, it doesn't work that way. I got I gotta hear from you. Okay. We need to help and encourage each other. Hebrews 10, 24 says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and unto good works. That is our job to, to encourage and to provoke each other. We need to love each other and we need to do good works. That is the mark of the Christian church. If we're fighting and scrappling and complaining and, and moaning and not doing anything, then we're not a church. Then we're, we're just a, a country club that hates each other. But we're not like that. I, like I've always said before, I love you guys. We've got a good group of people here. I see many friendships being made. Um, a lot of times, I sit by myself during the lunch. You say, oh, pastor's antisocial. No, I need a little downtime after I preach. I'm a little wired up. And what I want to do is I want to sit back, and I want to see you guys some pastors run around, and I run around, and I check up on everybody. I say hi. But I want to see you guys engage in friendships and fellowships. And I say that's the blessing of God. That's something that I prayed about. And when I see that, 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 that encourages me, and that, that gives me, that, I just feel good. I, I, I go home, I'm saying, wow, nobody's yelling at each other. Everyone's loving each other. We had a good meal. We had a good time. Everyone's hugging and kissing each other. And, and, and it's, it's a holy kiss. All right? Hebrews 3.13 says, but exhort one another daily. It's not just a Sunday thing. Uh, I hope that you guys that, that have these friendships can, can text and call each other and pray for each other during the week. All right? Paul says, uh, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You see, if we, if we kind of just do church on Sunday, 
come Monday, Tuesday, if we're not in contact, we're not exhorting, we're not encouraging, we can fall into the temptation of, of, of deceitfulness of sin. We could be tempted. Ah, where are those people? Why doesn't anybody check on me? Ah, I don't know about church. And then, and then you, can, you can get a hardened heart. All right, again, verse 14. Verse 14 has a, a lot of nuggets in here. It says, uh, we're to also be patient towards all men. All right? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, he says that charity suffer, suffers long and is kind. Charity envy not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It is not puffed up. Right? We as Christians are out of be patient people. Is that something on there? Oh, okay. All right. I'm going to try to be patient with that alone, you know, thing. All right. We as Christians are to be patient people. We're to put up with things we might not like. No, I thought that was the wind chime outside. I don't know. We got, the neighbor has a wind chime. Sometimes when the window, you can hear it. That's what I thought it was. But I'm going deep and I'm hearing something. I'm out. Of it. out of it. Remember, patience is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Right? Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Right? Long suffering means putting up with things that uh, for a long time that we might not like. Uh, we as Americans, we as New Yorkers are very impatient people. And if we just had a little patience and a little long suffering, uh, nine out of ten times the problem solves itself before you would even interrupt or, or lose your patience. Right? Amen. I've seen that a thousand times. I'm like, don't worry. It's by tomorrow that the problem will be taken care of. And, and it is. All right? Right? That was a nice verse 14. Now let, let's look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 15. He says, Paul here says, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. And as the old saying goes, two wrongs don't make a right. All right? Christians are not to seek vengeance. Um, in the flesh, I, believe me, I got my little black book, the list of people that, boy, if I can commit vengeance to, I mean, you know, you know, the old, the old days, you eat a 20 pack of White Castle burgers, and then the person you didn't like, you just threw the bag on their front lawn, and you drove away, and, you know, and then there's people that have, like, done, done your harm, that's, that's hurt you, there's family members, there's friends, there's neighbors, I mean, it's like, man, I got this plan, I'm going to seek vengeance, and God says, no, 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 no. God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. All right? Let, let, God, let God straighten the thing out. All right? Christians are, we just talked, we got to love, we got to be long-suffering. All right? We're not to render evil to evil. Paul said in Romans 12, 19, dearly beloved. You see, start, dearly beloved. Uh-oh. Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him a drink. For in doing so, thou shalt keep coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. All right? What's the old saying? Do unto others that you'd rather, that's the golden way, that others, that we, that we, do unto others that you would have been done to you. All right? Vengeance, I mean, believe me. <laughs> I got a neighbor, <laughs> but vengeance is all that God straightened it out. We all got a neighbor. Pops in front of your house. I got one neighbor. He plays music until 2 o'clock in the morning. And he's got, he, he don't got a boombox. He's got the speakers out of this big. He's a, he's a sergeant with the NYPD. So when the cops come, he's just, hey, guys. Eh? And I'm like, and, and he always does it on Saturday night when I'm trying to get a good night's sleep, you know, and I got to get ready for church. And, at three and then, he, then he passes over the mic, and they all start talking and screaming and drinking. I mean, I don't think, yeah, I don't know if it's vengeance, but like one of these, one of these Saturday nights, I just might show up in my underwear and my baseball bat and I take that speaker thing and kaboom in the name of the Lord with the, yeah. Oh, yeah, I get some, all right, let's, let's get off the vengeance thing. I don't get, my blood's getting all in. All right, let's get focus on turkey and loving each other, all right? Where are we here? <laughs> Okay, that's right. Verse 16. All right, here we got a good verse. Rejoice evermore. To rejoice means to experience joy and gladness in a high degree. To be exhilarated with lively and pleasurable sensations. Paul said in Philippians 4, 4, he says, rejoice evermore. And again, I say rejoice. Paul thought it was so important to rejoice that he repeated himself twice. 
Christians ought to be the rejoicing people. Christians ought to be the happy people. Christians ought to be the one, no matter what the circumstances in life, you can rejoice because Paul said rejoice evermore. All right? I'm sure you can rejoice when things are going your way, but can you get to the point where you can rejoice always? When things are going good. But what about when things go bad? Can you rejoice? You can rejoice when you got plenty, but can you rejoice when you don't have much? When you think everybody loves you, you can rejoice, but when you think everyone's your enemy, can you rejoice? Remember, Paul was in prison when he wrote this. And you know what? He was rejoicing in the Lord. All right? Paul says in verse 17 here, pray without ceasing. So we had, you know, one of the two of the three shortest verses in the Bible. Verse 16, rejoice evermore. Uh, we got pray without ceasing. I know it was in John uh, chapter 19, it's of Jesus, uh, Jesus wept, but some short verses here. But we're to pray without ceasing. This means, this means that we're to maintain the good habit of of frequent prayers, right? Prayerlessness uh, is a great sin of the church. You know why most churches, even including this one, you know, close the, the Wednesday night prayer meetings, is low attendance and people wouldn't pray, all right? Martin Luther used to say, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous said, if Christians spent as much time praying as they do grumbling, they would soon have nothing to grumble about. That's a good one. Right? Anonymous also said seven days without prayer makes one weak. W-E-A-K, all right? Spelling, all right? A little, a little, a little church humor there, all right? Prayer is the ultimate wireless connection between you and God, all right? No roaming freeze. All right? Prayer is a free thing that we can do, and God would want his children to pray and have a conversation with him. God answers all uh, knee mails, okay? Knee mails, another one. All right, you got to, yeah, come on, I'm on a roll here, all right? God answers all the knee mails, all right? You got to be praying. So far, Paul exhorts us to warn the unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, we're to be patient, we're not to seek vengeance, we're to be uh, a rejoicing and praying people. Now we get to verse 18, and you know, Thanksgiving week, and in verse 18 he says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. All right, this week is Thanksgiving, and us Christians are reminded to, to give thanks to God for what? Another great year, the year's winding down, and uh, we're gonna be starting a new year pretty soon, and what I'd like to preach for the rest of the message here are just a few things that I'd like to be thankful uh, to God for. All right, the first thing I'd like to thank God for uh, is his salvation. I right? like the choir saying it's the greatest thing ever. All right, the salvation, the, the minute that God saved you and that you became saved. All right, Titus 2.11 says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. What a great, simple Bible verse. Salvation has appeared to all men. Salvation is available to everyone. All right? And when a person accepts Jesus Christ as his personal Savior, God's grace moves in and saves you from an eternity in hell. And you know as you, you are now a child of God and you have his salvation. And thank God for salvation. All right? Another thing I'm thankful for is that when you got saved and when I got saved, the moment we got saved, we got the Holy Spirit. And thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit. 1 John chapter 4, verse 13 says, Hereby know we... Uh, that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us his spirit. The Holy Spirit teaches you things about God and yourself. Uh, Jesus said in John 14, 26, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Um, when you study your Bible and, and, and the things, you should be praying to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, teach me, guide me. Uh, let me learn this uh, uh, in a better way. The Holy Spirit tells you the truth. Uh, John, uh, Jesus said in John 15, 26, For when the Comforter is come, whom I will send, from, uh, send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. The Holy Spirit guides the believer. John 16, 13, How about when the Spirit of truth has come, 
He will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit prays uh, for us and intercedes for us. At Romans 8, 26, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself make an intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Right? Sometimes we're just not really sure what to pray, we're struggling, and there's that inner Holy Spirit that just groans and connects to God on our behalf. He intercedes, and I'm thankful for His, uh, his Holy Spirit. I'm also thankful for His Holy Bible, the Holy Scriptures. All right? Uh, Romans chapter 1 reads in verse 1, Paul, a servant of God, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, uh, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience uh, uh, to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom ye are called uh, of Jesus Christ. This Bible we have in our hand is called the Holy Scriptures. Right? Proverbs verse, uh, 30, verse 5, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Uh, this book is inspired. T 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable uh, to, uh, to, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. This book is preserved. Psalms 12, verse 7, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. All right, and like what I always say, inspiration plus preservation plus God's holy, uh, holy words, it's the Holy Bible. Right? You can rest assured that the Bible that we're reading today is the same Bible that the apostles and disciples had those thousands of years ago. You say, Pastor Hank, how can that be? You know, we don't have the originals. Right? There's, there's not an original writing of Paul that's in a museum in London or, or Paris or something. Right? But again, Psalm 12, verse 7, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. All right. God said he was going to preserve his word, and he did that through, uh, through the church, that people would copy and make copies of the Bible. And we have thousands of copies of, 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 uh, of copies that are thousands of years old. Why? Because God used the, the, uh, the, doc the doctrine of, of Bible preservation. The Bible, yeah, it can be tainted with. When you see a Bible that's, that's like authored by somebody that's not, you know, somebody that's not, uh, you know, um, like a modern Bible version that uh, they, they call it the, uh, the, the Queen James Version. It takes out all the Bible verses from in references to homosexuality. You have the Job Witnesses, which remove and add words to it. That stuff is nonsense. But we have in our King James Bible the perfect preserved book. All right? And God wrote a book that we can understand because the Holy Scriptures is God's book to mankind. Right, 1 Corinthians 14.33 says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches, for the saints. President Abraham Lincoln said, I believe the Bible is the best gift God has ever given to man. All the good of the Savior of the world is communicated to us through the book. All right? Thank you, Lord, for salvation. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Scriptures. And thank you, Lord, for uh, eternal security. Now, eternal security, if you don't know, is the Bible doctrine that a believer cannot lose their salvation in Christ Jesus. All right? Once saved, always saved. We, I believe in our churches and our doctrinal statement of faith, believe in eternal security. Some churches uh, believe that you can lose and get your salvation. You know, if, uh, if, you're, if you say you're a Christian and a bus driver... You cut you off, and you give him the finger, and you curse at him. You've just sinned, and you've just lost your salvation. Now you got to go back to the priest, and you got to pray, and you got to get resaved again. That stuff is nonsense. Right, here's five Bible verses on eternal security. Paul writing again to the church in Philippians uh, one verse six, being confident of this very thing that he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 6, 37, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will no wise cast out. 
Right? Jesus will, if you are eternally saved in the hand of God, he will never cast you out. Jesus also said in John 10, verse 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. There's nobody, there's, there's no devil, there's no demon, there's no human being that can take your salvation. It is a personal gift from God to you. All right? Amen. I mean, we don't hear too many verses on, on eternal security. All right, Paul writing to the church in Romans 8, 38, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, Amen. which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. All right, the government can't take the salvation away. All right, Oprah can't take the salvation away. Dr. Phil can't take the salvation away. All right, neither death, nor angels. What happens when you die? Boop, heaven. To be after from the body is to be present from the Lord. Amen. So don't worry about death. All right? Amen. Amen. Now, I mean, I'm for life. And I wish everybody can have a, a good, long life, but, uh, you know, but God makes his decisions, and sometimes he wants to take people, you know, early in it. But if, if you're saved and you die, you're going to heaven. No principalities, no powers, nothing present, no, no, nothing things to come. All right, Jesus said in John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. All right? And again, Father, thank you for eternal security. All right? You say, Pastor, what happens when I sin? Can I confess it? All right? It's under the blood. You're forgiven. You go, you go to bed each night. All right? Feeling, feeling that you've been forgiven. All right? don't, don't worry, you have eternal security. All right? All right? And fifthly here, I'd like to thank God uh, for you guys, for you are the saints. All right? Ephesians 2, 8, 2, 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And when you become a Christian, you become a saint, and you are now part of the family of God. We're fellow citizens. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. Right? We're in the family of God. We're the saints of God. Right? Remember, it's the duty of the saints to take care of each other. We looked a little bit uh, at this early in the message, but Paul, again, writing to the church in Ephesus, said, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Just as God has forgiven you, we ought to, we ought to seek forgiveness and also uh, forgive one another. We're to be kind to each other. We're to be tender-hearted. That's a nice word. Tender-hearted. You know, tender-hearted is not the, the phony, baloney Christian with, hey, how you doing, brother so -and -so? Hey, how you doing, brother so and so? And you turn back, ah, look at them, they got a cheap suit. Ah, why can they only put too much on the plate? That's not tender-hearted. Tender-hearted is giving that Christian hug, that Christian kiss. How you doing? I love you. It's good to see you. Ten it's at your heart just going, you're tender-hearted. Paul writing to the church in Romans 12, 10, he said, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. All right, Peter writing in 1 Peter 3, 8, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. There's an old German proverb that says, What I spent I had, what I saved I lost, what I gave I have. And the saints of God ought to be loving each other. The saints of God ought to be encouraging and exhorting one another each day. The saints of God should be helping each other. The saints of God should be praying for one another. Your best friend ought to be a saint. You know that? Your best friend. Now, I know we have, you know, friends and contacts. They're lost. You know, they're our family, our friends. But your best friend ought to be a saint. The people you run and hang out with ought to be saints. The one you plan on marrying uh, must be a saint. Right? You, you should strive to, to win your children to the Lord so they can be saints. The music you listen to ought to be sung by a saint. Oh, let's throw that. Oh, 
I was a pastor that said, I want to go in everyone's, every one of your cars in the parking lot, and I just want to turn on the radio and see what the last radio station that you will listen to. Was it Christian, you know, Christian AM 570? Was it News Talk Radio? Or was it 104.3 Rock and Roll? Yeah! I mean, some of you are pulling in the park like this scene, all of a sudden the music gets turned down, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm having a little fun here. We're almost done. But again, the music you listen to ought to be sung by a saint. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. All right? Thank you, God, for the saints. All right? Thank you, God, for salvation. Thank you, God, for the Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, for the Holy Scriptures. Thank you, God, for eternal security. Thank you, God, for the saints. And lastly, Thank you, God, for the Savior. All right, the angel announced to the shepherds abiding in the field in Luke 2.11, and we'll be looking at that in December, and it says, For unto you was born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And thank you, God, for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, Peter, who was a, a friend and traveled with the Lord for three years and wrote a couple of books in the Bible, and as a first-hand witness account, wrote... Simon Peter, a servant and of an apostle of Jesus Christ, to then have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is our Savior. He's also our shepherd. He's our chief cornerstone. He's our sanctuary. He's our sacrifice. He's the lamb slain according to Revelation 13, 8. He's our Shiloh. He's our peace. He's our secret. He's our... He's, our, he's sent of the Father. He's the seed of a woman. He's a servant. He's the morning star. He's a sure foundation. He's a quickening spirit. He's the shield. He's the king of the saints. He's the son of man, the son of God. He's our salvation, and he's our salvation. Titus 2.13 says, looking into the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, church, he's our friend, he's our Savior, and he's coming again. Amen. 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 All right, now going back to our text in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And thank you, God, for everything. And church, my fellow saints here, uh, have a happy, blessed Thanksgiving week. And uh, we're going to enjoy a nice meal and a nice fellowship together. Amen. Amen. And amen. All right. Nice sermon. All right, I try. Thank you. All glory to God. Okay. All right, let me just turn this off here.